Good morning, Vallejo Drive. Oh, that's good. Let's practice that one more time. Good morning, Vallejo Drive. You'll hear that from me almost every Sabbath because it's good for us to speak to one another and to welcome another. It also lets me know that you actually have a pulse in your wake. Those are important things before you start a sermon. As we begin our ministry together, let me first of all say on behalf of my wife and I how thrilled we are to be here as your pastor. We believe that the decision for us to be here was one brought by prayer and fasting, and we accept it as God's call upon our lives, and we look forward to ministering with you together. This church has a marvelous legacy of accomplishment, and while we venerate the past, we must look forward to the future. The God of our yesterdays is still the God of our tomorrows. So it's important that we take an opportunity to look ahead and look forward with hope and with optimism. I believe that our best days are still ahead of us, and God invites us to watch him work in our midst. Now, before I begin this morning, I want to take this opportunity to, first of all, thank Mark Papendick for the work he has done as interim pastor in this church and the entire pastoral staff. I also want to thank Fred Klein, our head elder, and the elder board for their ongoing ministry to this church. You know, I was thinking about the pastoral staff, and you have Mark, Luke, Peter, and I'm James. And I thought for a minute, we could call ourselves the disciples, become a grunge band, and go on the road. But I know that Visions of us on the road as a rock band probably will cause you to lose sleep tonight, so forget that I ever said that. I also want to acknowledge my family. You've already met my wife, Joyce, but I have a group of other relatives in the audience. I'd like to have them stand. My oldest son is sitting right here on the aisle. I'm going to ask him to stand. And the rest of my family members, wherever you are, I want to ask you to stand. I got family. These are family, family here. Thank you so much for coming out. One of the secrets to how I grow churches is I just invite my own family members to come in, and it allows us to grow. All right. Let's get busy. Lord, we now come before you to open your word. Speak to us. Give us guidance from above is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me first of all comfort you. For those of you who saw my sermon title, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? I just want to make you at ease. I am not talking about me. Gotcha, didn't I? Even just a little bit. We're going to learn that we're talking about a different dinner and a different invitation. Our preaching passage tells the story of an unusual dinner invitation that begins in Matthew chapter 9. And this is an invitation to Jesus himself. In Matthew chapter 9, and maybe I should, if I'm going to show you slides, I guess I should change the slide. We find this passage. As Jesus passed from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the, tax, at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. This Matthew was a publican. He was indeed a sinner by occupation. He was a tax collector, and the Jews hated tax collectors, but the tax collectors took money on behalf of the Roman Empire, on behalf of the oppressing army, and took it away from people, and they took a profit right off the top. Jesus says to this man, follow me. Jesus went out of his way to find a sinner like Matthew and invite him to be one of the 12. 
to those watching, Matthew didn't look any different after the call than he did before the call. Spiritual progress and transformation takes time. So he didn't look different, but he was indeed changed from the inside out. Look at verse 10. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and with his disciples. Matthew was so grateful. This works so much better when it's on, I see, yes. Matthew was so grateful that Jesus had stopped to call him that he decided to throw a big dinner party and invite all of his friends to come and see Jesus. And so he's in a home at a table with tax collectors and with sinners. Jesus was the surprise dinner guest. So there are a couple of questions that come up. Jesus loved to hang out with sinners. That's who he was. He left heaven to save a planet full of sinners. He loved to hang out with them. He was comfortable with sinners. But the other question I want to raise, why were sinners so comfortable with him? What was going on with him that allowed sinners to like him so much? Well, I believe it's because Jesus offered unconditional love and acceptance. Jesus, you see, was safe. He was safe to be around, and that's why people love to be with him. He was grace unconditional. That's who Jesus was. He says in John 12, verse 13, 32, he says, If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples unto myself. He has that ability, both while alive and certainly after he was dead, to draw men and women unto him. But then we get to verse 11. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and with sinners? Now, I have never been in a church as pastor where there was not at least one Pharisee. If you'd like to identify yourself now, you just save us all a lot of trouble. There are always Pharisees amongst the people of God. And these Pharisees were insulted that God would take the opportunity that Jesus would sit with sinners. They couldn't understand, if you're such a righteous man, why are you hanging out with publicans and sinners? But we find in Scripture, from Romans chapter 5, verse 20, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Jesus brings his grace to meet our sin. And no matter how big your sin is, there's still enough grace to take care of it. Somebody ought to say amen. Where would we be if Jesus hated sinners? In fact, the issue for many in the church is that we have come to hate sinners while we love sin. Many of us are what I would call voyeurs. We may not do the sin, but we like to watch the sin, and we approve of those who do. See, there is this concept of salvation by geriatrics. When you get so old, you just you don't have no energy to sin. So you think. But we sin in our minds. We sin in our attitudes. We sin by lacking love for other people. No matter how many chocolates you eat or how much tithe you pay or no matter what your multi-generational Adventist heritage may be, we need to understand that we are all sinners saved by grace. Some of you, I go back all the way to last year college days. God has been grateful to us. He's been merciful to us. I think of all the stupid stuff I did when I was in my 20s. None of you ever did stupid stuff in your 20s. I can tell you're exceedingly wise. But me, on the other hand, I, I did some really dumb things. And as we get to know each other, when I 
when I feel it's okay, I'll tell you about some of my, my stupidity. But God in his mercy still preserves, he still holds us, he still keeps us, and I'm grateful. How can I look down on the loss without remembering that there but by the grace of God go I? You know, we are like a lifeboat. The church is like a lifeboat. And all around the boat are men and women who are drowning in sin. How could any of us sitting inside the boat not lend a hand to bring somebody in, out of the water, into the boat. See, there are two types of people in the lifeboat. There are those who were born into the lifeboat, and there are those who were pulled out of the water into the boat. Have you ever noticed that sometimes the first people who want to jump back in the water are the folk who were born in the boat? Also, sometimes the people born inside the lifeboat think that they have an unusual right to the tree of life, that somehow they are a different set of member than those who were baptized into the church. But there's one thing they forgot. We who were born inside the church, I wasn't one, I was pulled out of the water, but those of you who were born in the church need to remember that you were born wet. You're just as wet as the people you pulled out of the water because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We live in a sinful world, a world of injustice and a world of inhumanity. I don't know if you're aware that here in Los Angeles County, 16% of our county, 1.4 million people live with food insecurity, which means they're not quite sure where their next meal will come from. We've read and seen in the news about border children, children snatched from their parents. Now almost 2,000 of them essentially incarcerated. And I've seen now ministers and churches and others demonstrating about what they feel about this. But you don't have to go to the border to show love for someone right here in Glendale. Before we go much further in this message, I would like to deal with the elephant in the room. I know there's been quite a bit of discussion about who this pastor guy was going to be. So I think I should deal with this once and for all. And although it may appear obvious to most, let me just come out and admit it. I am tall. I feel I'm so glad I got that off my chest. And even though I am tall, and you may be short, I love you with all the love that Christ can give. Because whether we're tall or short, fat or thin, bald or hairy, we are one in Jesus. Look around. A rainbow of men and women of different nationalities, different colors. We are one. And in unity, there is also diversity. And from that diversity, we find strength to move forward. Now that's over, we can move on with the rest of this message. Jesus said, my house shall be called the house of prayer for all people. All people. This is the legacy of this church. It's the reality of this church. So we should rejoice in our oneness. Now the Lord impressed me in my prayer about coming here. I said, Lord, what is that you want me to do here? There's a long trail of fine pastors past of this church, distinguished gentlemen. What do you want of me? And as I read and studied, the Lord impressed me with two things. Number one, he said to love you. So like it or not, I'm just going to love you. 
But the second thing he said, create an environment where my people love one another. I've had several of you tell me and confirm for me that that's exactly what you felt God needed to do in this church. I believe Vallejo Drive should become a citadel of God's love. That this church should be known by all who drive by or hear about it. That if they want to find love, they need to come 300 Vallejo Drive. Do you believe that? You see, Jesus understood that there is no stronger force to attract men and women than the force of love. That's how we will win this community. We won't win them by beating them overhead with tracts and, 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 or with Bible studies, although the Bible must be studied and must be understood. But how you win men and women is the way that Christ did it, and you do it by loving them. And when you love them, they will wonder, What's different about you? The love that we share with one another is an attractive force like a gravitational singularity. You get so close, you can't escape. And so the church becomes sticky because people come in and they feel so warm when they get there. They don't want to leave. They want to come back for more because people want to be loved. John thirteen thirty five says, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. This is the identification of the disciples of God. Not how well they can quote scripture, but how well they love one another. So guess who's coming to dinner? Every sinner we can love. That's who's coming to dinner. Let me just take a minute to tell you what I plan on doing in the next few months. With the, board, with the church board's permission, hopefully in the next 90 days, we are going to stage for leadership, a strategic planning retreat. It may be a day, it may be three days, where we will sit and prayerfully go through God's word to understand what is it that you want us to do moving forward. We need a plan in order to act out what God wants to do. And I think that plan will be based on a passage in Micah that you saw in the newsletter. Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. How do we fulfill that commitment in 2018? The humble walk of love. We will study that, and then we will implement how we, in this congregation, will fulfill God's mission for us. Jesus, in response to the Pharisees, said, They that are well need not a physician, but they that are sick. Who are the well? Have we met them? Well, if you understand what the scripture is saying here, the well in this context are self-righteous, deluded people who think they have no need of a savior. Well, who are the sick? All of us. For you see, well ones aren't well at all. But for sick ones like us, there is a remedy. And that remedy is Jesus Christ. Then he goes on to say, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. God is not impressed with our sacrifice. He's not impressed with our prestige and our pretense. Our righteousness, the Bible says, is like filthy rags. So what is he impressed with? He is impressed by extending us mercy. See, I used to pray for justice. I wanted God to to right all the wrongs in my life. Now I just pray for mercy. Mercy for me. Mercy for others. Because you don't want real justice. Because real justice would suggest that not even eat, not even we, would be okay. 
because of our sins. So we, we pray for mercy. We love him because he first loved us. Duty, by the way, will not save us. We have to serve God not from a sense of duty, but from a sense of gratitude for what he has done for us. There are some who are so wonderful in their own eyes, so wise in their own minds, they feel no need of contrition or repentance. I had a man once tell me in a Sabbath school class in a church that will remain unnamed for obvious reasons. He said, I haven't sinned in the last six weeks. And I thought to myself, you just sinned <laughs> by telling that lie. Because there's not, not only are there sins that we commit, small s, but there's also the sin that we are, capital S. We are born in sin, shapen in it. Before you ever commit a single act, we still are sinful in our natures. God came to change our nature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Christ is in the business of remaking sinners. So in his name this morning, I came to preach Christ and him crucified. I'm calling today for sinners to repent. And I will do that in just a few minutes. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. We'll finish that passage in just a second. Crucified men and women are kind and loving. Crucified men and women. Uh, I went faster than I wanted to go. Let's go back. Crucified men and women are safe. Safe to be around. Safe to hang out with. They don't judge you. They don't treat you badly. They don't speak evil of you, they are saved. This is why people were attracted to Jesus, because Jesus was indeed safe to be around. Crucified saints understand what Romans 8 chapter 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. If God doesn't condemn me, why would you? Why would anyone? When we are truly crucified, not only will we love sinners, but sinners will be drawn to us. The only cross that people will see today is the one that you and I climb up on. My question for you, have you climbed up on your cross? The crucified Christ must be crucified in us and we must be crucified in him. Ah, boy, this thing is really sensitive. We'll be in next week's sermon in a minute. Okay, there we go. Christ draws all men unto himself by the personal crucifixions of his people, of his followers. Have you experienced that crucifixion? The rest of that passage in Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ draws us all by his love. There is a monogram cross with your name on it just waiting for you. Hopefully you've already been introduced to it and you know it well. Matthew 16, 24 says, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. By your membership in this church, you have declared yourself to be a cross bearer. And if you don't bear that cross, if self is not crucified every day, then who are we fooling? What a shame it would be to spend 30 or 40 years come to church every Sabbath, paying tithe every month, 
not drinking, not smoking, eating vegetarian food and getting constipated. What a shame it would be if after all of that, you left your cross on the ground with the assumption that somehow you're going to see heaven. You know, there are several surprises that happen in heaven. The first surprise is the surprise that you got there. Second surprise is you're surprised that some of the people you thought would never make it are there. The third surprise is that some of the people you thought would make it aren't. Which surprise do you want? Well, if you don't get the first surprise, you don't, the other two don't matter. I'm more than willing to be surprised that I make it there. I want to be there. I want to see the Lord in peace. So let me close. You know, one of the things I've learned in my pastoral ministry is that you don't want to be the last thing standing between people and their food. But I haven't rushed today. I wanted to take my time because I realized that there is no children's church today, the children are with us. I'm not known for short sermons, so you'll have to pray for me. I'll get better. There's one more dinner party that Jesus wants to attend. And that party is found in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. What is fascinating about this passage? Jesus is doing everything he knows how to do to reach us. He stands knocking at the door, but then he says, if anybody hears my voice, which means he didn't say if anybody hears the knock, he said, if you hear my voice, so not only is he standing at the door, he's calling out to his people. But what I find fascinating about this passage, why is Jesus standing outside? This is the Laodicean church. This is the last of the, of the churches mentioned in Revelation. Jesus is not in the church. He's standing on the outside, knocking, trying to get in. Could it be that the so-called people of God have never let him in? And so the prophet John, seeing the church in his last days, is saying to us, you're rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing, but you don't have Jesus inside. And so he knocks. And so he calls. Let me read a passage to you as I close from Review and Herald, November 2, 1886. With every knock unheeded, our determination to open becomes weaker and weaker. If the voice of Jesus is not heeded at once, it becomes confused in the mind with a multitude of other voices. The world's cares and business engross the attention and conviction dies away. We'll finish it together. The heart becomes less impressible and lapses into perilous unconsciousness of the shortness of time and of the great eternity beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, don't let this happen to you. If you do not heed the call of God, this is our future. So one thing you need to know about me, I'm an old-fashioned preacher. I don't believe that anyone can join the church unless somebody asks them to do so.
people in different ways battle the fact that they are not as they should be as they should be. And they are still not as they should be. I like to draw to your attention that there's some of you like me. Without worrying about what other people think of you, your reputation. Someone here needs to open the door. Why are y'all looking at me? You must be having your heads down praying. Put your heads down. Pray. Because somebody's soul may be weighing in the balance. If you have heard God speaking to you this morning and you believe that you need that closer walk with Jesus, that you need to open your heart fully, unreservedly, and let him in, that you want him to take full control of your life and save you and your family. That's what I want. If you want that for yourself, would you just stand with me as we pray? I'll wait for you. God bless you. There are others. Lord and Father, we stand. Not because we have uh, achieved or have ascertained to salvation. We stand recognizing our need for a Savior. Recognizing that we may be in that number of those whose hearts have become unimpressible and that perhaps the nearness of eternity has escaped our minds. Lord, save us. Fill us with your spirit seal us in your truth you promise in John that you hold us in your hand and no one has the power to snatch us out of your hand Lord we pray for that in our lives that that would be our experience bless this church bless every believer before I close a prayer, there may be someone here who wants to be a part of the Vallejo Drive Church. You've been led here not by accident, but by divine appointment. If you sense that that is God's will for your life, just slip your hand into the air that we can identify you and help you. I see a hand right there. I see a hand back there. Brother, my, my pastoral staff, would you see these hands and talk to these individuals? Hand right here, hand there. Are there other hands? You want to be a part of this family? Just raise your hand. I see a hand right over here. God bless you. Just raise them a little higher so I can make sure I don't miss any of you. This won't take but a minute more. Keep those hands up so our elders can find you. Are there others? Praise God. Lord and Father, you have seen these hands. You know their hearts. We thank you for their decisions today. We look forward to the day when Vallejo Drive is packed to capacity with sinners and you come to dinner with us. In Jesus' name, amen.